Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Hello there, Baha'i Blogcasters. This is me, Rain Wilson, and I am once again delighted to have a very special guest because every week I say the same thing, how super excited I am to have a guest. And once again, just like every other week, here I am sitting at my laptop with my ridiculous looking customer service headphone on my head, uh, excited to talk to another Baha'i guest about their life journey, about their experience in their faith, about the intersection between their faith and their work. And this week's guest is the wonderful, renowned Susan Gamage from Canada. Hi, Susan. Hi, Rain. It's a delight to be here. I'm so excited to talk to you. I have so many questions for you. I first became aware of who you are, I think, in the same way that so many other Baha'is have, and that is through your wonderful blog. Um, Just in searching questions online, I'm researching stuff or or looking through the Baha'i writings for help on certain issues. Um, You have such a, a, um, a systematic blog and it's so deep, and it's, there's so many wonderful articles that it always floats to the top of the Google searches. And I have found myself not knowing you, never having spoken to you before. I have read at least 27 of your blog entries <laughs> over the <laughs> yeah, years. Of all of all. Yeah, yeah, indeed, of all of all. indeed, indeed, exactly. And and they, and it's brought me a lot of help. So I'm just really, um, you're an excellent writer. It's your answers are clear and concise and heartfelt at the same time. And that's a very difficult thing to do. And so congratulations on that wonderful blog. And you do other things as well, life coaching and kind of therapy type stuff. So who are you and and what are you about, Susan Gamage? I'm going to toss you the giant softball question to get us going. (laughs) Well, I'd like to start with a quote because this really informs all of my work and why I do what I do. This is, um, uh, the House of Justice wrote this to the NSA of Italy some time ago. And they said, what they desperately need is to know how to live their lives. They need to know who they are, to what purpose they exist, and how they should act toward one another. And once they know the answers to these questions, They need to be helped to gradually apply these answers to everyday behavior. It is to the solution of this basic problem of mankind that the greater part of all our energy and resources should be directed. Wow. So that's that's my marching orders and that's what what guides my work and that's uh, really the basis of everything that I do. I um, grew up in a very abusive home. And when I became a Baha'i, I loved that Baha'u'llah had the blueprint for getting the world out of the mess it was in. Mm. And I, I thought if he has the blueprint for the world, then he probably has the blueprint for my life too. Oh. And so I started reading the writings morning and night as, as we all do. And I was always amazed that whatever I read answered some dilemma that I was dealing with. And so for years, I just kind of collected those quotes randomly, put them in a file drawer so that I could come back to them at some point. And then I was invited to give a talk on violence and abuse, overcoming violence and abuse. And I thought, well, what is it I have to say? I I don't have anything to say really, but the writings have everything to say. So I opened the file drawer, I pulled out all of the quotes and put them in order and, you know, in order that made sense to me and then presented them at this conference. And they were so well received Mm. and it it was actually a book, (laughs) you know, it was, Mm. there were so many, it, it became a book. So that was my first book. It's violence and abuse and reasons and remedies. And when I was going through the depths of my despair in trying to overcome uh, my past, 
I desperately wanted to meet somebody, anybody who had gone through the process, came out the other side and was able to look back and say this was worth it. Ah. And I, I couldn't find anybody. So I made a commitment to myself that if I got through this, I would turn back and show people what I did, how I did it, how I overcame whatever it was I was overcoming. Well, that's, that's and, so wonderful that really what you wanted to do, I'll let you finish your story, but I just want to interject and say that, that you wanted to overcome uh, the trauma of your abuse and live a, a rich, productive, purpose-filled life. But part of the reason why you wanted to do that was not just selfishly, but also so that you could lead the way. You could help other people on that path and, and serve others with what you discovered. Absolutely. You know, the first Baha'i book I was introduced to was The Promulgation of Universal Peace, mm -hmm. Abdul Baha's um, talks in North America. And I never read it for decades after, but I bought it. And it was my first Baha'i book. And I loved the title. I wanted to be part of creating peace in the world. And I was thrilled to know that Baha'u'llah had the blueprint. And part of the blueprint involved overcoming, you know, the world is a very violent and abusive kind of place. Mm -hmm. And so if I could overcome, you know, my own personal uh, past and help make my family better, then my community would be a better and then the world would be better. Mm, mm. And, and if I could share that blueprint with others and other people could be working on that too, then, then that would be my gift to the world, you know, my, my, my purpose, if you will. Well, that's fantastic. Um, I'd love to hear, can we go back just a little bit? How did you hear about the Baha'i faith and become a Baha'i? Well, I grew up in the Catholic Church and my family were involved in some kind of a cult. And I don't know a lot about that because my experience of it is a child's experience and I haven't, you know, I don't have an adult framework to put that in. But I turned away from all organized religion at the age of 15 and became an atheist. And I was, you know, I, I didn't believe there was a God. I used to pray fervently as a child, you mm. know, please make it stop, make it stop, make it stop. And it just got worse and worse and worse. So I'd convinced myself there was no God. So fast forward a number of years, I'm working with a, a woman and she takes an apartment next to me. So we became good friends. And then eventually she quit her job. I quit the job. She moved away and I hadn't seen her in about six months. So then we met each other uh, in a big store and she was going up an escalator and I was going down an escalator. So if you can imagine sort of a 30 second conversation about, you know, <laughs> uh -huh. what's happened in your life, mm -hmm. you know, now she was the most conservative person I have ever met in my whole entire life. Wow. And within six months, she had had 13 major changes culminating with, I became a Baha'i. Mm. And I had never heard the word before, but I had convinced myself that this unbelievably conservative person could not have made that many changes unless she'd somehow got into a cult. And that drove terror to every fiber of my being mm. because I had escaped and I didn't want to have to go in and pull her out. <laughs> mm, <laughs> I didn't mm. want to have to go back into that environment, mm. but I was prepared to do it. And instead she pulled me in <laughs> and <laughs> there's been no looking back. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. But how, how I went from being an atheist one minute to a Baha'i another, I, I, you know, that's a mystery that God will answer when I get to the next world. But just a funny story. I decided that um, I would sign my card about February 28th. And I decided I would sign it, you know, the end of March. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then I gave my head a shake and I said, if you really believe that Baha'u'llah is who he says he is, then you've got to sign your card now and start the fast. <laughs> ah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there was sucker. no avoiding. <laughs> That's sucker. Right. You should have waited that month. You should have just <laughs> gone to the Bahamas and drank Mai Tais and ate your fill and then, then declared. 
I, I yeah. love what you say on your website uh, about identity. This is this is a, I'm just going to quote you from your website, um, and then we'll continue with your your story of who you are and what you do. It says you define yourself like this. You say I'm Susan Gamage and I'm a Baha'i. At one time, I labeled myself as an assistant manager of a convenience store. So we have something in common, Susan, because I was an assistant manager of a paper company once. Long story. Uh, an orientation and mobility specialist, founder and executive director of a nonprofit, coordinator of an area-wide social economic development program, a researcher, a writer, a life coach, an ESL teacher, an author. And later, you, you labeled yourself as an abuse survivor, suffering from anxiety and depression, having PTSD, as a result of severe and prolonged childhood abuse, divorced, a single mom, bisexual, nearly bankrupt three times, single, alone, and lonely, unloved, and unlovable. And then you say, but that doesn't tell you who I am either. When I believed the labels I attached to myself, I was filled with fear, self-pity, guilt, shame, remorse, bitterness, unforgiveness, hatred, self-loathing, the labels kept me trapped in the prison of self, veiled from God and separated from others. But that doesn't tell you who I am either. I could tell you my story, but I've learned that it's the stories that separate us and the reactions that unite us. And as a Baha'i, I'm more interested in finding points of unity. And so let me introduce myself. I'm Susan Gamage, and I have been a Baha'i since 1982. I am a mine rich in gems of inestimable value. Nice tip of the hat to a quote from Baha'u'llah, and I'm a sinner. I was created by a God who loves me and tells me his work is perfect, so I believe that even as a sinner, I'm still perfect. And you have a quote from Abdul Baha, we are all sinners and thou art the forgiver of sins. Um, that's a really uh, profound way to introduce oneself. I have a couple questions about it. I also want you to finish your story. But what is this phrase that just popped out? It's the stories that separate us and the reactions that unite us. What do you mean by that? You know, my story is so off the chart and people can't hear it. Mm. Um, and then because they can't hear it or because they are so profoundly affected by it, they demean their own stories. Mm. I, was, I was in a 12-step group one time with other Baha'is and people went around the circle and everybody was telling their story. And, you know, there was a lot of emoting and a lot of uh, emotion that was coming up as people were telling their stories. And there was a woman who told the story of being so ashamed that she could not get the dishes done. Mm. So she couldn't have Baha'is over and she couldn't, you know, host gatherings. And, and the shame that she felt was as profound as any shame that I felt. Mm. And then it was a big aha for me because it helped me to realize that it's the shame that unites us. It's the fear, it's the anger, it's the whatever emotion that we're dealing with, that's what we have in common. Mm. Our stories are just the, the stuff that causes us, no, our spirits to that's, grow. That's interesting because, you know, as a as a storyteller in my work, that's what you're always striving for, is those universal truths. And it can be really simple little things, you know, the loss of your first pet, um, the feeling you get when you're dumped for the first time, um, the feeling of elation on your, you know, your first trip someplace foreign in the world, or, or whatever it is that there are these universal human experiences that do unite us, that you can highlight in storytelling and I mean storytelling by like books, novels, uh, movies, TV shows that um, that are universally related to or relatable, regardless of what your personal story is. It doesn't matter where you grew up or what you've been through. Absolutely right. And the other thing is you have a bit on your website about being a sinner and about sins. God is the forgiver of sins and you having sins. And it's, it's interesting because I, in reading that, I had a reaction to it because I, I really feel like although the word sin is definitely in the Baha'i writings and um, sin and sinner is, is quoted, as you quoted here, um, often in the Baha'i faith, we don't really 
focus on that as opposed to say Catholicism and the idea of the original sin and we are all sinners and born sinful um, as opposed to the actions we take being sinful. I'm, I'm just wondering about your your connection to that word and why you highlight that or what's important about that for you to recognize yourself as a sinner. Absolutely. I suffered from anxiety and depression and post-traumatic stress and I was using the traditional therapies, all kinds of ways to try and heal. And it really wasn't, you know, it, it would cure, you know, it, it would take care of sort of a day-to-day -day symptom, but it, it really didn't cut at the root of it. And then somebody introduced me to a book called A More Excellent Way by Henry Wright. And he's a Christian minister who studies the Bible very deeply. And every single page of his book has multiple quotes directly from the Bible. And he really believes that every that God doesn't want us to be diseased and that he's created us whole and that it's our sins that cause the disease. And he backs up everything he, he says with the Bible. And it got my attention because he referred to a sacred book of God. And so I took an online course that he did and he he called, he changed anxiety and depression into fear and self-pity. And that really got my attention. And his point was, wow. As, wow. Lo as, lo as long as it really was, because as long as I believe I have anxiety, then I have a medical condition that needs a medical solution, probably pharmaceuticals. And that's just the end of it. But as long as I can see it as a sin or something that I'm doing that God doesn't want me to do, then I can make a choice about it. And it was so empowering. I can't even begin to tell you how empowering that was. And it just, it changed my life. And it actually helped me to cut off the root of anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress and give me my life back, mm. just following his instructions. And so, you know, a lot of my blog postings um, stem from his teachings mm. and, and just knowing that I was a sinner and that I was, you know, it says in the hidden words, you know, I, I created the, you know, uh, my, and my work is perfect, you know, question it not thereof. And part of the way that he created us is with a higher nature and a lower nature. And the lower nature often is ascendant in most of us. And, and that's where sin comes from if you will. And the word sin and its synonyms are used like many thousands of times in ocean if you <laughs> if you want to do the research. Mm -hmm. and the permutations and combinations. So it's really there in the writings. I took everything that Henry Wright said um, and I went back to the writings to see if I could find a, a you know the quotes in the writings that sort of backed up what it was that he was saying and and for sure they were there so I actually wrote a book called um, overcoming anxiety and depression that's in the publication process which basically sort of outlines that um, whole process but I find the whole concept of sin very liberating you know mm. because I'm a sinner you're a sinner the members of the house of justice are sinners we're all sinners Abdul Baha has told us that right mm. and you know like some of us have bigger sins than others and so you, you, don't, know, you, for, don't, you don't find that shaming not at all I mean as a Christian growing up I found it very shaming. It is a very shaming term, but I actually found it empowering. Hmm. I find anxiety and depression a lot more shaming and a lot more disempowering. But a sin, I can do something about. A sin is just my lower nature acting out and now, but, I can change that. But answer this question. So you were horribly abused as a child and you, as an adult, were suffering from PTSD and anxiety I assume a lot of that from that. And you you didn't do anything wrong. That was not you operating on your lower nature, your animal nature, or selfishly. That was done to you. Right. So this is this was a big aha for me. Mm -hmm. I was horribly abused for the first 17 years of my life. And that was at the hands of that wasn't it wasn't my fault. Although, you know, any abuse survivor will tell you that they think it was. 
but you know, we'll leave that one aside. But it wasn't the events so much that happened to any of us, to any of us. It's what we tell ourselves about the event. So for example, I believed that I must be unlovable because in order to be treated this way, right? So, and you know, for 50 years, I told myself I was unlovable and I really believed it. And lots of other things, you know, um, I believed as an outcome of those events. And so here, um, Morty Lefko was another person who really helped me to separate an event that happens and the, the stories or the lies we tell ourselves about the event. You know, nothing, I'm not good enough. Nothing I do will ever be good enough. Like we all have those, you know, not good enough parrots on our shoulder. Right? Sure, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, we got that hamster wheel going round and round in our head with all these negative thoughts, right? That's what's coming from our lower nature. And that's what's got to shift if we can move from our lower nature to our higher nature. Mm. You know, it's it's interesting you say that. The um, a, a kind of a breakthrough for me in my just my own personal work and and my failings and my sins and overcoming them and in my therapeutic work was kind of I came to this this phrase kind of fell into place and it really made everything better for me and that was I am a deeply flawed and worthwhile human being and uh, that really I found liberating because um, I was such a perfectionist perfectionist and I lived in so much shame over bad things that I had done and ways that I had acted in my past that um, it was really freeing for me to just see myself as a deeply flawed human being. And exactly then, right. And then I was saying the long obligatory prayer and uh, several years ago, and this popped out at me. Uh, I love this one phrase where um, he, he, he says, um, Thou seest, O my Lord, this wretched creature knocking at the door of thy grace and this evanescent soul seeking the river of everlasting life from the hands of thy bounty. And that's, that's exactly how I was thinking about it, that we are both of these things. There's a, there's a yin and yang to it. There's a, a darkness and light that we're, we are both wretched creatures and evanescent souls. Yes. I love this quote from Prayers and Meditations that says, every time I venture to make mention of thee, I am held back by my mighty sins and grievous trespasses against thee. And find myself wholly deprived of thy grace and utterly powerless to celebrate thy praise. My great confidence in thy bounty, however, reviveth my hope in thee and my certitude that thou wilt bountifully deal with me, emboldeth me to extol thee and to ask of thee the things thou dost possess. So how many of us feel like we're held back by our mighty sins, right? We've done something wrong and we think, well, I might as well keep doing other things wrong because God's never going to forgive me anyway, mm. right? Mm. <laughs> and so I love it that he's talking about how we can be held back by our sins and find ourselves wholly deprived of his grace. But we know we have confidence in his bounty. We, we, we know that that confidence is what can revive our hope in him. Mm, mm. What a gorgeous quote and uh, fascinating topic. We could spend the whole episode on that, but I want to get back to you and what you do. How did you choose this profession? I'm, I'm very curious how your kind of blog and life coaching which are kind of interrelated, but kind of different. Your blog is about various Baha'i topics. And I noticed you just did one on the most recent letter from the Universal House of Justice, which was a, a really terrific study guide to that profound March 1st letter. And, but how did you choose, how did you stumble into this profession of uh, whatever it is you call it? Well, again, when I was um, dealing with my abuse issues, I ended up on long-term disability. And I was really struck by um, a quote. This is, I used this one to beat myself up with, you know, that we're told to earn our livelihood by our calling. And so I kept asking myself, you know, what is my calling? What is my calling? And I often, I'm a good listener. And my friends started calling me Susan Arrow 
because they felt like I could hear whatever it was that they were dealing with and go right to the point and right to, you know, asking the right questions that would help them break through Mm. an area that they Mm -hmm. were stuck. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people were suggesting to me that I might make a good life coach. So I did some research and I thought, okay, this is maybe, you know, a way that I can earn my livelihood by my calling and and then right around that time was when I found the quote from the uh, House of Justice about what they desperately need is how to live their lives. And and so I started writing articles for the blog in a way of trying to build my credibility as a Baha'i-inspired life coach, as somebody who could understand how to, you know, I, there's nothing that I love more then you give me a problem and let me go to the writings to see if I can find a solution for it. Mm. You know, I just, mm. I just, I love doing that. So if I could do that and get paid for it, wouldn't that be earning my livelihood by my calling? And a, and a great way to combine service with, uh, with work. Yes. So what are the most common struggles that people or issues that people come to try and get help for? I'm just you know, asking. I'm asking these days because I read I read this article recently talking about this opioid uh, epidemic that's through the United States. I assume it's through Canada as well, um, where it's oxycontin and oxycodone moving to you know and Xanax and then moving to actual heroin in mid America with you know middle class white people uh, hooked on heroin in places like Ohio and Nebraska and and it, and this person was saying like they called them the despair drugs and the drugs that you, I don't, I didn't even know what they meant. Like drugs you take when you're in despair or drugs you take to try and cure your despair or drugs that cause you more despair. And it seemed like such a anxiety, PTSD, depression, despair. These diseases are so rampant in society right now. They're actually killing people. People are, are dying by the thousands because of these diseases. So, sorry, that's a, I'm getting very <laughs> epic and dark here, but that's, I'm just curious what, what people are coming to you for. Well, it's, it's interesting that you ask that. I know somebody who died from uh, a, a drug overdose that way. Um, I recently heard an article that talked about the root cause of addiction is lack of relationships, lack of connection. And that really resonated with me because one of the lines in the long healing prayer, one of the names of God is the best lover. So God wants us to develop a profound and deep relationship with him where he is our best lover. He's our physician. He's our companion. He's our friend. He's our, you know, you just have to look at the long healing prayer to see who he is in our lives and who he wants to be. So I think that the way to overcome addiction is through that relationship with God, Mm. Mm. making God our best lover. We all have addictions. It's not just to drugs or alcohol. You know, you mentioned earlier about being perfect, you know, perfectionism, you know, that's an Mm -hmm. addiction that I share. Uh, Workaholism is another addiction. Workaholism is huge. It's huge, especially in the in the big cities, like everyone I know in Los Angeles is a complete workaholic. You know, well, a 70 ev- hour everywhere. weeks are 70 hour weeks are just standard. Absolutely. And I think it it's everywhere, you know, because people are doing they're so businesses are so concerned with the bottom line that they trim the staff so that people are actually doing the job that used to be done by two or three people. And um, so they get drawn into that. And workaholism is praised in our in our culture. Yeah. Um, so it's really hard to break free of. You know, everybody hates a, an alcoholic or a gambler or whatever. You know, but right. everybody loves a workaholic. So it's, no, it's a lot. It's so true. A lot I, I always, harder to break free of that. I always think of the uh, whenever I look at the magazine Vanity Fair, which I used to subscribe to a long time ago, and then I got rid of it because it had a profile every month of a completely materialistic workaholic. Like every month this person was, was put on a pedestal. Like here's a guy who made a billion dollars by the time they were 40 and they worked 80 hour weeks and they own this, these 12 yachts and aren't they, ama- aren't they amazing? And, um, 
and even the title of the magazine, Vanity Fair, it's got vanity, which is a sin, right in the in the headline. And I was like, <laughs> you know what? Maybe I need to spend my time reading reading other magazines or periodicals. <laughs> More uplifting. Yeah, I'll just read Brilliant yeah. Star over and over again. Right, exactly right. <laughs> um, and can you share some tips or suggestions to people listening right now that so uh, how do you, how to use the writings for your problems how to how to what's the what would be the bahai way to delve into these issues uh, well you know this is why there's over 600 articles on my blog and i've got 600 over yeah, and I've got over a um, hundred of unfinished blog postings that I'm just itching to get finished and and uploaded. So it's there's no simple answer to that question. Yeah. Every yeah. every situation is complex and complicated, but I really think that forgiveness is a key to a lot of things. I think that we carry a lot of hurts mm. from people who have hurt us in the past and we don't know what to do with that. And, you know, as Baha'is, we're supposed to, you know, be loving and forgiving and unified. And, you know, we try to do all of those things, but we're just sort of, it's like putting a Band-Aid over a wound, right? The wound is still there and it keeps getting infected and reinfected and reinfected Mm. as long as there's no forgiveness. So I do a lot of work with people helping them to identify who has hurt them, who's broken their heart and what needs to be forgiven. And not only for the other person, but also what needs to be forgiven in themselves and what needs to be forgiven in terms of their relationship with God. Because, you know, as a child, I felt really abandoned by God and I was pretty mad at him Mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. And, and I had to heal that. I had to forgive God, if you will. (laughs) Well, that's, that's interesting that you bring that up, Susan, because I've known a lot of people like that. Um, I was just talking to uh, the father of a Baha'i friend of mine, who's not a Baha'i and in his seventies. And he was terribly abused in various ways by his Catholic upbringing. And, um, just had obviously still it was in his seventies and had so much anger and pain around it that he couldn't even like up, tiptoe the the topic. He couldn't even approach like the idea of God or religion or faith like that. He had just kind of like chalked it up. It's like not for me, not for me. So I think this is a very common thing. I think I know people, I know Baha'is that have had just terrible things happen to them and have lost parents or children and just. Uh, incredible tests have come along and that that test has led them to really resent God as well. How do you get over a a resentment or feelings of rage or betrayal at the creator? Yeah, that's a really big one. That's a really, really big one. Well, you got five minutes, so ready, go. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it, it has to be, you have to, Our purpose in life is to know and to worship God. So Mm. our very purpose is that we have to develop that relationship with him. Mm. So I don't get anybody in my coaching practice who is so filled with anger that they can't even have that relationship. I, I, have people who have a damaged relationship and are at least open to the possibility of, you know, strengthening their relationship with God. Um, So I don't know those people who are so damaged, I don't know how to help them. Baha'is who've accepted the authority of the, the revelation, then I can find the quotes about how much God loves us and how short this world is and how long eternity is and how you know, what are, what's going to happen to us when we get to the next world and how wonderful it is. And I came across a quote just the other day about, you know, a a dew drop of God's love is of more profit to us than anything in the world, Mm. this world or the the next. Mm. And so I'm, I'm thinking that all he wants is a dew drop. You know, he can give us a dew drop and that is better for us than anything. And so if you can, if I can help find quotes that deal with a specific issue around why somebody might have distanced themselves or a Baha'i who's accepted the authority, then it helps them to see another way of looking at their problem. 
and to develop and strengthen that relationship with God. Mm. In terms of him being the best lover, you know, often in marriages, we think that our spouses are supposed to be our best lovers. Mm. And that's not what God wants. He wants us, he wants to have a primary relationship with with each one of us. Mm. And the closer that we draw to God, the closer we become to each other automatically. Um, So, you know, I'm single and sometimes I can feel really sorry for myself and really just, you know, have a bad day and I just want a hug, right? And so I was lying in bed one night feeling really sorry for myself and really angry with God at my lot. And I said to him, if you're supposed to be my best lover, then I want a hug. I need a hug. Hmm. And the next thing I knew, I woke up. It was morning. (laughs) I had a really good night's sleep. (laughs) And I recognized that that was the answer. That was my hug. It felt like a hug from God. That's fantastic. It really did. And so we can all, you know, get creative in terms of how we strengthen our relationship with our creator. And that's what I try to help people do. That's beautiful. Help them to see that he's a loving God, not a punitive one. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He expects us to to fall down. He expects us to fail. He expects us to be a sinner. He created us that way. I'm glad you said that because I think of that a lot. There was uh, some writing that I'm not going to even remember now or be able to to Google while we're on this uh, Skype call together. But where um, it has become very clear to me like, okay, wait a second. God could have made us all perfect angels. He could have just yep. populated the earth with 7 billion perfect angels who all loved each other perfectly. That's not the point. That is exactly not right. the point. The exactly point is, right. is that we are deeply flawed and worthwhile human beings. And both and things are true. Both things are true. And we got our stuff to work out in this world and in the, in the, in the subsequent worlds. And yep. so we're a bunch of deeply flawed people with character defects and... Um, and, and bad things that happen to us. And bad things that happen to us and bad things that we do to other people. And we got to work this stuff out and it's, and it's okay. This is how God exactly. made us. Like Exactly. It, it, it's all okay. And that's, and that's the human struggle. And that's what's so beautiful about the human struggle. And that has been illuminated in, in, in plays and in literature and in poetry since the dawn of time, that ancient, that ancient human struggle. Exactly and, right. And speaking of human struggles, there's... Um, you write on your blog a lot uh, about your bankruptcies. And I wanted to ask you about that because I was so struck by this March 1st letter from the Universal House of Justice. In fact, I think we're going to do a blog cast on, on the letter itself um, about this radical concept of the spiritualization of money. So money and economics being spiritualized as evidence of God's justice on earth. And I'm just wondering what you learned in your journey through those bankruptcies, your issues with money, <laughs> and how you have spiritualized your relationship to, to money and economics. I invest in the bank of God. Okay. What's the return at, on that? At you, 10, 10%. You get 5, 5%? Oh, 10%. 10, 10, 10%. That's like if Bernie. You, those are Bernie Madoff numbers. <laughs> if you read at the, at the front of the prayer for the fund, the Baha'i fund, Baha'u'llah says, I'm just going to quickly look for it so that I, I can yeah, good. Um, say it accurately. Good. Be ye assured that in place of these contributions, your agriculture, your industry, and your commerce will be blessed by manifold increases with goodly gifts and bestowals. He who cometh with one goodly deed, a dollar, you give a dollar to the fund, will receive a tenfold reward. Wow. So God will give you $10, $10 so back for thousand, every dollar you So that's a thousand percent give. return. Exactly. Yeah. There is no doubt that the living Lord will abundantly confirm those who expend their wealth in his path. Mm. Mm-hmm. So I think we get, you know, in, in our culture, we get really hung up this time of year, especially with RSP contributions, right? We got to, we got to put money aside, you know, but how much do the banks pay you for your RSPs? You know, I bet it's not, <laughs> not a thousand return, fold return on your investment, right? Mm-hmm. So 
So when you give your money sacrificially, we're, we're asked to give sacrificially, right? We're asked to give till it hurts. Mm -hmm. God will, there's no such thing. That's the point. There's no such thing. You know, I can be worried about my fund donation. And I, I do <laughs> sometimes, some months. I think, I, you know, this, is, uh, this hurts, you know, this hurts. And, and here are all these other expenses that are coming up. And how, how's that going to get paid? It always does. I really love this section in the letter. And I'm, I'm going to not quote it right now. But where it just talks about, it's almost like a really going into what conscious consumerism and conscious capitalism of, um, you know, where you spend your money, how you spend your money, how it affects the earth, how economics affects the earth and the environment, how, uh, how much you pay your employees and uh, what is the worth of, of an employee and that um, so much about money is in our society is like, it's hectic and it's, um, and it's self-involved and it's unjust and it's hoarding as much as humanly possible for oneself. And uh, thinking of money as especially the spending of money and the, and the paying of wages and the building of businesses as a spiritual enterprise is really revolutionary. Well, it really is. And um, you just wrote a book. Uh, I don't know if this is your most recent one, Fear into Faith. What's that about? Um, well, that's really about overcoming anxiety, mm. you know, because, because I call anxiety fear, right? And, okay. um, and the opposite of fear is faith because you can't have both dwell in the same heart. I had a therapist say once that uh, anxiety was fear with nothing to latch on to. Exactly right. Um, so w can you give us a, a little uh, sneak peek into fear into faith and this uh, overcoming anxiety? Yeah, well, I mean, the bottom line is you have a choice. I had said that prayer, you know, that prayer that we all say, it's probably the first one we learn, you know, oh God, refresh and gladden my spirit. Mm -hmm. I had said that for 30 years, 30 odd years, maybe more. And it never once occurred to me that that was a prayer of choice. Mm. I will no longer be full of anxiety. I will be a happy and joyful being. Mm. And when I started to realize that, I, st I, I actually, whenever I, I feel anxious or I feel depressed or whatever, I stand up and I stomp my feet on the way on the word will. And I say will really out loud. I will be a happy and joyful being. Mm. And it always makes me laugh and it always breaks that negative pattern. So the thing about anxiety is we have a choice. And the book helps people to see what the choice is and where it is and how um, how to make it in, in your life. And it's all the writings, you know, it's all based on the writings. Mm -hmm. And what do you, I ask this of every uh, guest, what do you, what are you struggling with the most right now? What are you, what is your spiritual struggle and uh, what are you working on personally right now that you can share? And if there's any quotes that you're dwelling on for that uh, test that you're dealing with. So I wanted to have another revenue stream. And I thought, you know, a number of years ago, I've written all these blog postings and probably some of them are on the same theme. And I wonder if I could just make books out of these articles, right? Mm -hmm. And and so I did that. And I've I've written about sixteen books, and um, wow. they're all they're all at various stages of the um, of the publication process. Mm -hmm. But I have had so many blocks to getting these things published. I I can't even begin to tell you how many blockages there have been. Mm. And and so a few months ago, I just gave up. I just said, okay, God, obviously, you know, if this isn't your will, then I'll walk away from the books. I'll just, you know, people, the content is all on the blog. They can, they can read the blog. And so I started to focus on, um, you know, that there's a prayer, um, make me ready in all circumstances. Oh my God, 
And it talks about, let my movement and my stillness be wholly directed by thee. Wow. And yeah. so that's that's become my mantra. And every day I, I just start the day and I say, let my movement and my stillness be wholly directed by thee. And here's a clue, Ray, Rain. This is a cure for workaholism. Uh-huh. Because, because anything that doesn't get done on my to-do list, mm-hmm. if I've said that prayer, is God guiding my stillness? And so I don't have to feel bad that that didn't get done that day. Wow. Oh, that's great. That's great. So that's, that's a big aha. Uh-huh. And you know, I, I kind of like giving God my day because odd things happen. <laughs> like this morning, I am so excited. I'm, I'm the only active Baha'i in my cl- cluster. And I'm very lonely and I, I love to be around my people. You know, I, mm-hmm. whenever I go to a large gathering, I tell my friends I'm going to be with my people. Well, this morning I had a phone call from, I can hardly even talk about it. She's a Chinese Baha'i. She's from China, has just moved to my town. Oh. My town. That's great. You know, my little town in rural Canada with an inactive uh, a cluster and a high unemployment rate. She's, she's come here with her husband and her three-year-old. And she is very deepened. And she's done all of the Ruhi books. And she t- asked me if she could tutor me in books 11 and 12 to help her with her English. And I didn't even know 11 and 12 were out yet. I, I didn't know that either. This is news <laughs> to me. This is the greatest gift that God could have given me today. You know? Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, God. and I, 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 I certainly thought that I, my day was going to unfold very differently, but this phone call just changed my whole day. And that often happens when I, when I turn my day over to God. Unexpected things happen. Oh, that's fantastic. That's great. So, and, uh, and what are you reading these days? What Baha'i works are you reading or, or history or, or holy books? I had the incredible bounty during the fast of saying prayers every day with uh, Jana Denton House, who's a Baha'i inspired marriage coach. And I had told her that if we said the prayers for the fast, you know, it would take about just over half an hour, which was a real stretch for her in her schedule. But the day that we decided that we would actually do all of them, Mm. um, um, we we got to the end of the the books, or we we were saying them. You know, she would say one paragraph, I would say the next. We were alternating paragraphs. We get to the end of the prayers in my prayer book, and she starts another prayer. And I thought, oh, she's reading off of the Baha'i Prayer app on her phone. So I've got that app downloaded, and so I quickly went to my app and found where she was. She was saying a prayer and discovered that there were two more in the app that weren't in the prayer book. And the last one in the app is a very long one. And we didn't, we didn't know that because we were in the middle of it and just kept going and going and going. <laughs> and I'm, okay. I'm, looking, I'm looking at the clock and going, oh, no. <laughs> you know. And this prayer just kept going and going. Well, at the end of the prayer, Jana and I were just in awe, in bliss, we were, we didn't want the prayer to end. We were saying, this is the best prayer we've ever, we've ever, we've okay, ever read. I just want to say that, uh, Susan, I just pulled it up and you're absolutely right. So the, the two long fast prayers that, you know, we attempt, I attempt several times during the fast, but not every day, are 1500 words and 2000 words. And that prayer that you're talking about is 2,800 words. <laughs> exactly That's right. huge. It's one of the longest <laughs> prayers, if not the longest prayer that it live, exists. I don't think I've said it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I, 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 I encourage everybody to go and say it, even though it's not the fast. Jana and I have, we, we spend half an hour a day now just deepening on this prayer and studying this prayer. Oh, and we're, okay. we're, just, we're, just, we're just having so much fun. And, and it's just been life-changing in terms of helping us understand just how much God loves us. Mm, that's beautiful. Well, what a great note to end on, Susan. It's been such a delight uh, speaking to you. And for people that are interested, it's just susangamage.com, isn't it? Yes, it is. And there's information on, on your 600 blog posts, 
more about who you are and ways that people can um, interact with you uh, in kind of as a spiritual life coach. That's right. And on my site also are three database sites, Baha'i Quotes, Baha'i Prayers, and Baha'i Stories. Yeah. And I have a whole database of, you know, really good stories or really, you know, prayers that aren't in typically in the prayer books that yeah. speak to me yeah. and, you know, the quotes. So if people are looking up for you know, material for their newsletters or whatever, they could use the database sites. And there's also a prayer section on my website where there are recorded prayers mm. um, available 24-7. Mm. If, you, if you just want 10 minutes of listening to somebody else say prayers, mm-hmm. um, you know, you, it's the dial-in information. Unfortunately, it's an American number. So unless you've got a good phone plan or you're in the U.S., you know, mm-hmm, might, mm-hmm. might not work for you, but gotcha. that's, on, that's on my site too. And then, you know, some of the books that I've written that right. uh, are available as PDFs are there too. Right. And you have a kind of a library bookstore on your, on your website as well. I do. Yes. Of all of the kinds of books that support the life coaching that I do. Oh, wonderful. The top, Baha'i topics of interest on, on various topics of interest to my clients. Well, it was such a pleasure speaking to you. And I, and I just want to say really from my heart that the way that you've taken your personal pain and transferred that into service to others is very inspiring. Thank you so much, Rain. Alawapa. Alawapa. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much. And good night.